Okay. Uh, my name is Bernd Mohr. I am serving as the moderator for this uh, webinar, and I welcome you uh, to our third webinar, which is titled Application Benchmarking with Tube, Lessons Learned. Um, and I'm extremely happy that we have Mark andre Hammans uh, with us from uh, uh, RBTH Aachen, uh, especially because he's not a the developer of a tube tool, but he's a very active user. And I expect a, a very interesting talk, uh, which basically gives you a real, realistic uh, view about the tool and, and what you can expect and what not. Uh, not like the usual uh, developer tools where they like, uh, are over optimistic how useful their tools are. So, uh, Mark J. Hermans is a, a member of the HPC team at the uh, IT center of uh, Aachen University. Uh, he focuses on tools and interfaces for performance analysis of, of parallel programs. And um, he's, oops, uh, sorry. He's also involved uh, in the design of implementation of various courses. So he's, he's like very, um, uh, very uh, experienced trainer. Uh, on all topics of parallel programming for, and, and for high performance computing. And uh, next to supporting HPC users as part of a competence network for high performance computing in our state, North Rhine Westphalia, it's called hpc.nrw. He also contributes to the development of online tutorials and courses uh, within this competence network. So, as I said, we have a very experienced presenter and a very experienced user. Uh, of, of Tube here. Uh, he's a longtime user and advocate of Tube and uh, created configurations and used it for very uh, applications and benchmarks. My name is Brent Moore and I will be moderating uh, this session. Um, so of course, uh, we want to interact with you. So you can use the chat to ask questions to the speaker and the moderator and or report any technical issues is if we uh, uh, arise during the uh, Zoom session and we will try to take care of it. Um, uh, some useful information, like uh, it would be nice if everyone keeps the microphone muted during the session to prevent background noises and, and only turn it on when we actually uh, explicitly ask you. Um, you saw already and, and you confirmed to that that the session will be recorded uh, and you, you and other people will have access to it uh, soon on our, our website. So basically the floor is yours now, uh, Mark Andre, and please start. Sorry, Mark, you have your phone, your mic muted. Sorry about that. Okay, so <laughs> let's start again. Um, yeah, thank you, Bernd, for the introduction and also for inviting me uh, to speak about Tube today. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm uh, um, uh, a vivid user of Tube um, and also an advocator and um, uh, basically pestering all my colleagues about how. Uh, they should use Jube and how they could integrate uh, Jube into their workflows. Um, and uh, the latest uh, work that I uh, did with Jube was uh, creating an application benchmark suite. And uh, basically, this talk is about the lessons learned in uh, how to work with Jube um, when you're uh, basically starting such an endeavor. Okay, so the, the outline for this, this uh, uh, talk today is that I have a very, very brief introduction into Jube. Um, and uh, then uh, I will present eight lessons that I learned while preparing the benchmark suite, which are also kind of like uh, recipes. So instead of lessons learned, it could also be considered a Jube cookbook, uh, if you wish. So, and then we'll uh, finish with a brief summary of the key ideas of what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, well, why would you want to use Jube in the first place? It's a tool to automate workflows. So that um, can be benchmarks, but um, like in the application benchmark suites that um, I was doing lately, but I also used it uh, for 
uh, creating performance measurements as part of uh, publications. And um, we also integrated uh, a Jupe workflow for the software testing uh, and um, basically rerunning uh, batch jobs and uh, um, analysis workflows of the uh, performance analysis tools for Alaska that we developed. So what is nice about Jupe is that um, while you can easily automate some of the wor workflows with uh, shell scripts, Jupe takes care of all the isolation that you would need. So if you if you start a shell script twice on the same directory, you're very likely going to overwrite some of your output data. Um, maybe uh, intermediate data is going to be read in by some of the jobs, parallel jobs, concurrent jobs that are uh, running. Um, and uh, that might skew your results. So what Jupe is really good at is um, it's isolating your individual steps. So you can actually have lots of different parts of your workflows run uh, concurrently. Also a good uh, part of, or a good feature um, of Jupe is that it can automatically parse your output. Um, so it provides uh, an easy infrastructure to define regular expression patterns that you can search for in the output of your scripts and applications that you have. Um, the only caveat here is that the patterns are based on line-based matching. So if you have um, uh, if you have uh, complex, let's say, two D tables that you um, have an output of, and you want to parse that, um, it becomes quite tricky, and you probably have to uh, create some additional scripts to kind of render this into uh, line-based. Um, or prepare this for line-based matching again. So, but then also once you have all that uh, uh, output extracted and recorded by Jupe, it's then again easy to generate CSV tables or even pretty print tables. And it has a basic support for statistics like minimum, maximum value, standard abbreviation average. Um, uh, yeah, um, and that also, helps uh, quite a bit for the easy cases. Um, Jupe is written in Python um, uh, itself in Python 3, but it also runs uh, with Python 2. But I think by now, uh, I think everyone should have made the switch to Python 3 anyway. It uses uh, XML and YAML for the configuration, although I am kind of old school uh, in, in the way that I use mostly XML and not the YAML features. That's uh, 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 something of the, uh, the latest uh, versions. It's freely available, so you can just uh, type pip install jube, and uh, it'll uh, install um, uh, on your computer. It's also available in Easy Build or sp uh, the Spec Packet Manager, or you can download it uh, directly from the uh, Ulich website and install it manually on your computer. So the Jupe workflow, um, and I would assume that you're already familiar with this uh, in general, is that you have different stages. I'll, I'll call them stages because a step is something else. Um, and uh, in the first stage, you run, you initiate your workflow, and that's that's called running in um, uh, in Jupe terminology. And from there, uh, within the workflow, you might have some asynchronous. Uh, um, a synchronous task. So uh, the Jupe will return to you as a user, but uh, the, the benchmark or the workflow is not finished yet. And you can continue that. And while you continue, uh, you can analyze any of the output that was already generated. You can uh, generate tables from the analyze, uh, analysis output. And you basically continue this cycle until your workflow is complete. And then you output uh, the final results. So um, with, with uh, um, presenting the lessons learned of uh, um, creating an application benchmark suite, um, this talk is 
for users who have um, basic knowledge of Jupe. So if you, you should have seen and worked with Jupe. Um, you should know the basic structure and elements of the XML and YAML configuration. Um, you, you should have written single configurations, smaller configurations, so you kind of know, um, have, have a, let's say, some knowledge of the look and feel of uh, working with Jupe. And uh, you should have uh, um, also have obtained already some uh, uh, experience in using Jupe run continuum uh, and so on. So if you don't have that yet, um, uh, there are some uh, nice tutorials online, or at, at least I found two. Uh, one of which is from Sebastian Lures uh, on YouTube. It's uh, like a 36 minute uh, introduction to Jube. Um, Sebastian was the main author of uh, uh, Jube, and um, I think it's a very nice uh, uh, overview and introduction. And um, uh, uh, about like eight months ago, I uh, provided a um, a Jupe by example introduction, um, uh, which is also available on YouTube. And um, uh, there you uh, uh, find an introduction to all the entities that you need to create, to create a benchmark. Okay, so um, what can you expect in this uh, webinar? It's gonna be a list of individual, uh, individual lessons for, uh, um, and, yeah, for specific tasks, and each of those is basically a solution to uh, one of the challenges that I encountered while creating this benchmark suite. So your mileage to a specific problem might, might vary, but I hope this uh, is going to be useful to you. So each lesson uh, comprises the problem statement of, um, or let's say the, the challenge, and um, a solution statement and uh, some discussion and basically diving into the details of the configuration on how to overcome uh, the challenge. Later lessons may depend on earlier ones. So if you skip around in the slides later on or in the video and there's something that you don't understand, uh, you might want to revisit one of the earlier lessons uh, where I might talk about those. So, but um, also, Due to time constraints, I uh, can't talk about all the challenges uh, that I encountered. Um, might be an interesting topic for, for a second uh, webinar on this. All right, so let's warm up with uh, lesson one, user consistent naming scheme. So um, with uh, sufficient modular, modularization um, in your configuration, you end up with lots of parameter sets and file sets, and they all need to be used, um, but basically included into your workflow. And uh, if you have an inconsistent naming scheme, uh, the configur configuration of your benchmark is uh, at some point going to be hard to read. And uh, so uh, with a complete configuration of one of the smaller applications uh, that is in the application benchmark suite, I have a total including the shared one that's shared uh, among all uh, applications, um, then uh, uh, that has a, around 2,000 lines of XML. So it can become messy if you don't uh, tidy up uh, early in uh, your workflow. So what, I, what basically works for me is that uh, parameter sets, I have a suffix, suffix uh, P set, uh, substitute set, I have the, um, the suffix sub, underscore files for file sets, and analyzer for analyze uh, for the an, uh, analysis part. So that, um, or actually underscore pat for patterns uh, as well, I missed that in this, uh, in this list. So um, with those, you basically end up uh, with what I think to be uh, quite easily readable uh, use statements where we have three P sets or three pattern set, um, uh, parameter sets uh, at the top and the file set and the substitution set. Okay, so that hopefully wasn't too complex. And um, the uh, let's dive into lesson two, uh, where I think it's uh, also one of the basic um, uh, yeah, paths that you should um, uh, 
that you should trade is create a hierarchy where possible. So each platform, when you do an application or when you benchmark an application, each platform might require you to adapt specific parameters. And if you have multiple uh, benchmarks, even uh, each benchmark might, uh, might be or might require you to adapt certain settings. Um, uh, but at the same time, you uh, still want to share as much as possible. And in Jube, um, basically hierarchy and inheritance is the way to go here. Um, also something that I try to uh, strive uh, when developing this uh, benchmark suite is that the benchmark definition or the benchmark configuration itself should be free of any platform specific um, uh, uh, configuration. So the, if, if I have the configuration for an application like Romex, in that specific configuration, I do not want to mess with what's the scheduler, what's the compiler, what's the other software, uh, and how, how to basically load or identify modules. And um, so um, still, as I said, multiple platforms may use the same values for specific parameters. Yeah. Um, so. Um, the way you should think about your hierarchy is first you load basically sensible system defaults and those come from platform XML. Platform XML is a file that is predefined and shipped with Jube and uh, there are different platform XMLs for different schedulers. And those you might want to uh, want to adapt to your uh, to your benchmarks uh, in general. Yeah, um, so uh, you overwrite those those defaults that basically ship with you uh, with defaults that you want to uh, use uh, for all benchmarks on all platforms. Going from there, you want to overwrite specific ones, just a subset of those with values specific to a certain platform. Then you want to overwrite those again for all the runs for a specific benchmark. And then uh, at the very end, you have um, uh, parameters on parameter values for a specific benchmark run. Yeah, like you might have like a scaling experiment or uh, an experiment at a certain uh, uh, fixed scale. Yeah, those are the, the last, that's the last level of your configuration of the benchmark. So looking at that um, uh, in basically more uh, a visual way, you have the platform XML uh, at the um, very beginning. And the way of inheriting values in Jupe is uh, the init with attribute to uh, the different like parameter sets, file sets, um, substitute sets, and so on. So uh, talk, um, basically implementing the idea we had on the uh, previous slide, we would have um, the, the platform XML contain the defaults, yeah, and that should be available um, if it's properly configured in uh, the Jupe include path. And uh, then you create a default XML, which is the, the first agenda uh, uh, part here, where I usually also have a slight hierarchy in, inside where, where I have defaults, um, uh, like default parameter sets, um, and then potentially specific parameter sets that um, I select via tagging. And then the default one uh, here uh, is basically, again, contains values that are valid for everything. And the, the specific P set that might be triggered um, or selected by a tag um, uh, overrides those. Um, with, but usually it over, only overrides the subset of uh, these, yeah? So um, then again, uh, we move to what I call system settings, which is uh, like default, um, contains data for all benchmarks, all platforms. And system settings then adapts those general uh, uh, concepts with, uh, with settings and parameters that are specific to a certain platform. So um, like, how do I, um, uh, uh, like how many sockets are on the, on the system? Um, 
is there a way to automatically uh, derive that, or is this uh, a fixed value that I just set in the in the settings and so on? Um, and uh, then at the at the very top level comes the uh, the actual benchmark configuration. And if you started with Jupe in a, in a rather small um, uh, in, in a rather small example, you probably leave out the defaults and system settings or have left that, those out. Yeah. And uh, my proposal would be to actually include this because uh, in, in this middle part lies where you can, uh, lies all the potential for your reuse that you can have uh, with um, uh, benchmarking multiple applications. Okay. So when we agree that we uh, want to have the hierarchy and the uh, inheritance, um, there is another lesson to be learned here, and that is to organize your hierarchy in subdirectories. Um, the problem or the challenge is that the init with um, attribute requires an explicit source file and uh, an explicit parameter set name. Yeah, so there is no dynamic way of having a certain uh, initialized with a certain name. So you need to find a way around um, that limitation. And uh, the way to do that is to create subdirectories for system-specific configuration. And in that uh, um, subdirectory, you place your system settings XML, yeah, and, um, uh, um, and potentially additional support scripts like batch script templates um, uh, and so on. And um, you can use the, uh, or you should use the same file names in each of the directories. So at the end, you have a list of uh, directories like system clicks, system jewels, system uh, Lichtenberg. And those are basically uh, three different uh, subdirectories for three different clusters. And each of those has a system settings XML inside of it. Yeah, and um, then you basically dynamically add the system under test to the uh, Jupe include path. So your, uh, your static information of that you want to use a system settings XML is in your configuration and doesn't have to be adapted. And the dynamic part of the information comes from an environment variable that you use. So, um, one suggestion on how to do that is you create an environment variable where you say uh, export benchmark system uh, equals clicks, and then um, you would have uh, the um, common system dash clicks subdirectory um, added to the include path. But you can also um, directly add a specific uh, um, directory to the jupe include path environment variable, and you would need the hard-coded include paths uh, there. So that's uh, basically two flavors of the same solution. And the way you would then basically be able to, to work with is that uh, you have uh, your benchmark configuration that has a system P set, which defines uh, um, like how many tasks, uh, how many processes, how many threads, uh, how many nodes, uh, and so on. And you initialize those with the system settings because the system settings define how many nodes you have, uh, how many uh, sockets and cores you have per node, and so on. And that influences your selection. And uh, so um, in the system settings, you also have system P set. And that is initialized with the de defaults XML. And the defaults XML has the system uh, P set as well. And that is initialized with the platform XML. And here, actually, it's called system parameter. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, so but your application, the bench XML, only sees the system P set. And it's basically uh, um, all of the nitty gritty details are abstracted away. Uh, in the different uh, configuration files. So in lesson four, uh, we prefer dynamic parameters over tagging. So what does that mean? Um, parameter sets are um, usually chosen via tags, or you can uh, um, basically include and uh, exclude uh, um, entities by tagging them. Then you can select either 
include this in the XML configuration um, or in the in the specific run configuration if the tag is given or if the tag is not given. And then you have blocks of blocks. You have uh, uh, blocks of code that basically uh, are visible or invisible, uh, but are basically part of the same um, uh, the same configuration file. Yeah, and uh, I think tagging is quite heavyweight. There are good uses, um, and we'll see some uh, later on. But uh, um, the problem is a tag is valid for the complete run. So if you need a more dynamic um, uh, or then um, yeah, dynamic behavior inside your parameter sets, tagging is not really um, uh, a good way to use here. So, um, and uh, fortunately for parameters, there are different modes you can use. And I really like the mode Python because that allows you to write uh, teeny bits of Python code into your parameters and that's gonna be evaluated. Uh, we'll see uh, one of the caveats with, um, uh, with this is um, that uh, what is evaluated here has to be a Python expression. So it's not a Python script that is run, it has to be um, uh, uh, Python has to be able to basically uh, plug all you provide here into an exp uh, uh, basically an expression, evaluate that. So what we see here is uh, you gain uh, dynamic behavior if you have a parameter that's the selector and that is set to some value. And then um, uh, you have a different parameter that is mode Python. That means this one's dynamic now. It's going to be evaluated. And it's uh, you uh, create a dictionary here. So that's the, the Python way to, um, uh, to define a lookup table. And you directly, directly um, select one entity. And uh, the, um, the key to your uh, dictionary is the selector um, parameter. And if that is not found in here, which it is not because it would be my selector value and we don't find it in the keys. So it'll then uh, fall back to the default uh, value here. So, um, but you can also um, have a variation of this and we'll use that later on as well. So that's why I introduced it here. Um, you can, uh, create the dictionary as a separate text parameter. So this, the dictionary itself is not dynamic anymore. And um, now you can use the, uh, the dictionary here um, in other parameters. And then basically the text, because it's not a mode Python here, that's very uh, important to recognize. And uh, then it basically copies the text that you have here into uh, this part and you have the same automatic um, uh, dictionary uh, resolution on, or lookup expression in there. Okay, so with understanding how to uh, get some dynamic behavior into our parameter sets, let's move on to lesson five. Uh, and that is allowing for adding values to options. The problem that you have is when you initialize or you have this inheritance, you can only overwrite parameters. You can't add something like you would do when, when you, um, for example, add uh, a path to the environment variable path. Then you would do an export, capital letters path equals your path, colon, dollar path. And that is kind of like a recursive definition. Yeah, and uh, that's not possible with parameters in Jupe. So you have to find a way around that. Yeah, and um, so um, the the way to to do that is you create a dictionary again, but you create two dictionaries. Yeah, one with default values that basically represents the values that you as the, the benchmark um, writer have already um, uh, ha have already defined and you want to keep those. And one with uh, user defined values or let's say benchmark level values. Um, you can also, the default could be the system level values and the 
user defined to be the benchmark level values. And um, you kind of want to uh, combine those to uh, um, uh, a global dictionary that you can then use for your lookup. The caveat here is Python has no inline dictionary combiner yeah, and we don't have a script. So all the examples that I could find online um, on how to dynamically basically combine two uh, Python dictionaries in, a, um, uh, uh, in an expression basically, or there was no uh, expression that could do that. It was more um, uh, uh, having, multiple lines in a Python script. So what comes to our rescue is that we can use a slight detour through using the list combiner because lists um, can actually be combined uh, in a single expression. So if we look at the, at the code, it becomes just slightly more complex, um, but still um, uh, I think it's it's quite elegant. So now you have two dictionaries, the dict default and the dict extra. Yeah, the default would be have the default values and the user defined values would be extra. And then um, we have this example where those are actual um, uh, static text parameters. So the, those, Although they have the text for Python dictionary, they're not mode Python. And one thing that you have to uh, remember is that you need to adapt the separator uh, for this pattern because otherwise um, Jupe will basically uh, um, create, uh, basically takes this as a list of values and will create basically a, on a larger parameter space. And that's usually not what you want in this situation. So, uh, so you have those two, and now you need to, to combine those two uh, dictionaries. And the way to do that is um, that you basically, you know, let's go from, from, from the inside out. So you have uh, the dictionary default, to, default which has a method um, items, which basically creates a list of the key value, key value, and so on. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a list of those two strings, and it's always going to be key value, key value, and so on. And um, uh, you do the same for extra, and if it's the empty list, it's the empty list. That's why we define, uh, specifically define an empty list and not an empty parameter here. And then, um, so you basically, you uh, create a list from those items, you combine those with plus, and then there is a creation routine for creating a dictionary from a list, uh, from a well-formed list that has key value, key value, and so on in there. So uh, you can create your dictionary, and then at the very end, you can use the selection as you, as you did with your, um, uh, with your previous uh, more static dictionaries. Yeah, but now you can, uh, define some system specific keys and maybe some poten potential benchmark specific or user specific uh, keys as well. Okay, so the next one. So I think the, the that was the uh, the cut for the let's say low level or easier to understand um, uh, uh, lessons, and now it's going to uh, start to be become more complicated or more complex. Let's, let's say more complex. I hope it's not complicated. So and, uh, lesson six is detection versus selection of your environment. And there is the first thing where I can't really give um, an opinion on what you should do. It, I, my answer to, to the question, what should I do, would be, it depends. And so we'll look in, um, uh, into this uh, um, in a little bit more detail. So usually you want to replicate your benchmark runs, yeah? And that means you kind of need to control how your benchmark is, uh, is compiled or created. And uh, that means you um, have uh, usually some form of a build environment. And if you run Jube, the current environment that you have in Jube um, is all uh, that, that you started Jube in is available within Jupe. Yeah, it, 
um, uses the same environment that you have. So you have two approaches. You can either use that environment and then detect all the, let's say, the compiler, the compiler version, and so on. And uh, basically record the, the basic um, elements of your environment and then ensure um, uh, you have to ensure that you create the right environment before running the benchmarks. Because usually, if you have a special compiler loaded and not the default environment, and then you write a, uh, a batch script, and then the, um, a, uh, a plain batch script will start with the default environment. So if you loaded some, um, some modules in your environment, you will have to load the same uh, um, the same modules in your batch script as well. So that's where, where we're now looking at, how do I get from my current environment to what I need to write uh, automatically into my batch script so that everything runs um, in a well-defined well behavior. So, and um, uh, next to specific paths, for, for example, you also want to uh, detect specific versions because in your output, you want to know whether it's the Intel compiler or the GCC. You want to know which version of the Intel compiler it is, whether it's 18.0, uh, 90.0, uh, uh, 90.1, and so on. So um, you can do a lot of this detection, um, and, and it's actually quite easy as well. Um, and uh, um, uh, the, but the second approach is quite a, um, a different route there is you specifically set an environment. That means what you do in Jube or what Jube does for you becomes independent um, of, uh, uh, of, your, uh, of your current environment. That means you can also continue in a different uh, in a different shell uh, because it doesn't matter with which modules are loaded or not, and that is uh, one of the caveats that when you detect them um, or when you have Jube run on the current environment, um, then uh, you might have some interesting behavior if uh, you don't recreate the same environment before running Jube again, and by specifically uh, moving. Um, all of that logic into the your configuration, you kind of eliminate the, the problems there. And that uh, is what I was going for with the application benchmark uh, suite that I created lately. Okay, so, but let's have a look on uh, how you would go about um, detection or detecting uh, the current currently loaded modules, for example. And um, there I would uh, use a parameter name, loaded modules, and uh, here I would use a different mode, which is mode shell, and I would just echo the loaded modules and pipe that through SED, and um, then uh, uh, replace all the colons with white uh, with a space. So, and that um, uh, will then result in the loaded modules parameter to be a space saturated list of all the values uh, of all the modules loaded. And uh, then I can use that uh, in, uh, in another parameter, module load, loaded values, and then that will directly load all the val uh, basically the same environment that was loaded uh, at the time this was detected. Okay, and the uh, the other way uh, or the other um, uh, uh, example of uh, how to how to get a compiler version, for example, is you would look at the output, for example, of ICC version, and um, then you see okay the compiler version is printed out on the first uh, first line, so you basically uh, pipe that into head, take the first line and you pipe that into cuts, and you know that uh, the uh, compiler version that you are interested in is um, the third value from the left in your string. And you would basically go about this um, for all the interesting values that you, that you want to do or that you want to record. Okay, so 
that is basically the, the, the detection approach. Let's have a look into the selection approach. So the idea here is you define your software environment from within uh, Jupe. And um, uh, I separated the software into what I call tool chains and the software environment. But uh, in principle, you could also combine those into the software environment. Um, so in, in basically, both of those uh, those terms are a collection of which software in which which version is used to build and run your benchmark. So um, as we're not detecting which modules are loaded, or um, you now need to define modules and available modules in your um, uh, in your uh, uh, in your configuration. So, and then module names, as you've probably experienced, if you uh, have been around the more than one HPC system, module names are system specific and usually vary across platforms. So uh, what you should do here is create an abstraction for uh, each of the relevant software. And that again, uh, the method to create that abstraction is the init width and the hierarchy that you uh, create or that you created in the previous lessons. Okay, so let's um, have a look at how uh, like the, the basic parameters uh, work for uh, creating such a um, selection scenario. So I would create a parameter set modules environment P set, and there I would um, uh, first need to query what's the module name for a certain entity. And I reuse my dictionary idea from before and have some form of the, uh, um, of the module names um, dictionary here. And I get GCC and I get some value out of that. And if I don't get a value out of that, the default value is again, lowercase GCC. Yeah. So those don't have to be the same. It's just a default that I chose uh, in this example. Yeah, but we don't, what we see here, this is the defaults XML. So these are the default values for all benchmarks on all platforms. So you have some more uh, module GCC core and also the compiler module, which is a little bit, um, which is part of the tool chain and a little bit special, um, but you would basically have a, um, a software module name for each of the parts uh, that, or each of the libraries uh, that your benchmark um, uh, relies on. You, so you might have a, a CUDA module name, you might have a CUDNN uh, module name, you might have an HDF5 module name, and so on. Yeah. So this is um, the points of ellipsis here usually mean there's lots and lots of equal code in between. Yeah. And then you have a list of required modules where you list all of these modules here. And there would be like, if you have a, a compiler module name, um, uh, okay, um, as I said, this is a little bit special, but if you would have like a CUDA module name, you would also have a CUDA module parameter later on. And you would uh, have um, uh, that CUDA module, which is the specific module for your environment uh, and that list here on a space separated list of, of required modules. And then you can create a parameter, which is like load modules. Um, and uh, that then will take this space separated list. And that's a shell expression here uh, or a small shell script uh, that gets rid of whatever modules are loaded at the moment and loads each of the modules individually. Yeah, and the the only way that you or the only uh, thing that you need to uh, make sure is that the um, the the order in which you load modules and that the order you basically prescribe here with the uh, order in which you place these placeholders um, that is something that you uh, uh, have to take care of, and then basically you can have you can call this load modules or evaluate this load modules every time and basically recreate your, uh, your modules. So, but as we said, uh, let's go back. This was default XML. Uh, the module names 
as I said, are system specific. So they are not in defaults XML. The module names are defined in system settings XML. And there you would have the static dictionaries where you basically have uh, the translation of the GCC compiler is called lowercase GCC in all my configurations throughout. And on this system where the system settings XML is from, that module for GCC is called um, uh, is lowercase GCC. On a different system, it might be uppercase GCC or or GNU or something like that. Yeah, can have the idea is that these module names gives the translation from uh, your your internal handle string handle or key to what is it on this specific system. Yeah, and uh, uh, Jube allows you to do that to have the defaults XML, which is in the lower in the hierarchy, to uh, basically call something uh, that, is hier uh, that is defined higher in the hierarchy of your initialization. Yeah, that's also one of the nice features that you can easily use. Yeah, and here we do the same uh, for like the module names and also for the compiler modules. Yeah, where I say, okay, if I want to have GCC, uh, 11.2.0 as the version, and I want to have a specific version, uh, that module name is just 11 uh, on the system, on this specific software. So you can have the translation table uh, here as well. Uh, again, um, uh, you should note that these are just text definitions of Python dictionaries and not mode Python parameters. Okay, and the way to, to use that then is you would have something like a compiler's module you can uh, say get, and you have a compiler name and compiler version. And in something like your, uh, your tool chain, you would then just define, okay, in my GCC CUDA tool chain, I want to have compiler name GCC, compiler version 11.2.0. And unfortunately, I erased the parameter uh, in here um, uh, earlier today. And uh, that would be uh, a parameter named CUDA version and just a version of CUDA. And that's why this was the tag GCC CUDA. Yeah, so you then basically, this is the level that you create tool chains and software environments where you specify a name uh, for the compiler to use. And other than that, basically CUDA is um, um, uh, self explanatory There's only one CUDA. Um, and uh, uh, then for those, or there's only one HDF5, and then for those, uh, um, you uh, you specify just the version. Okay, so and yeah, and that's here um, how you, how you would use uh, that with the GCC CUDA. The CUDA version would be uh, 10.1. 10 .1. So this would be a combination where we have a GCC compiler 11 uh, with a CUDA version 10.1. So, and then if you uh, have a, uh, the step build where you actually build your benchmark software, you would then um, have uh, your load modules, which automatically resolves to module purge, module um, load, and load my compiler module, like all the tool chains uh, and CUDA uh, and so on, and then do the configure. And that is the, the only caveat with, uh, with the selection. Uh, the the do um, directives, they use the environment that Jupe was started in. So if we want to use a different one, we have to use this, the, use this load modules um, uh, every time we want to have do directives. So that's why you have the load modules here as well. But personally, I think that's just a small price to pay and uh, I um, got quite far with using this scheme. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, we're already quite late. We have two lessons left. Um, so uh, lesson seven is reuse builds for um, large benchmark codes. Um, as I said, uh, um, uh, I usually build my benchmark uh, to a specific compiler, to specific libraries and so on. Uh, because those all may have an impact on the application performance. So I want to record that and I want to have a special build and a controlled build for them. And um, 
some of the benchmarks actually take quite long to build or have large libraries or binaries um, uh, when they have uh, static linking and so on. So building the benchmark uh, for each run is wasting time and storage space. So you want to have some form of redundancy of reusing basically automatically building your application for a certain configuration if it's not there. But if it's there, um, uh, automatically use that and directly go to the run stage. So the way to, to do that is you install the benchmark software, not inside the, um, uh, uh, the normal run deer and the, basically the sandbox, but you break, you kind of do a jailbreak here and you install it into a well-defined uh, directory that is external to your run deer. So for example, your, your run directory might be on dollar work, but your install path is on dollar home. Yeah, and um, uh, even though I said I like the sandboxing, I like the sandboxing for the um, for the runtime part, um, uh, and not so not necessarily for the software installation part. So I have no problems with installing the software in a well-defined uh, directory in my home. So. But what you should also consider here is that you create also an environment script that can easily be sourced that uh, contains all the settings that are re relevant to basically have this, um, the, create this environment, like all the like LD library paths and, and so on. Everything you, you need, um, need to have there should be inside of that environment script. And then um, instead of doing load modules, you would do something like load env that would just source the environment script instead of loading the modules. And loading the modules would be part of the environment script. So let's have a look on how, um, how this might look. Um, also as a, as a skeleton, skeleton, there are a little, little bit more, um, there are, there's more to this. Again, we have uh, points of ellipses as different places in this configuration to fit this on the slide. So I have a new parameter set for my environment. I define an uh, environment script name here, um, and it's um, uh, I call it environment.sh. Uh, the update mode here for this definition uh, doesn't actually matter because it's not dynamic. But what I could do, um, uh, and I probably should have done that in this example, but um, with a limited space, um, I, I kind of decided against that, unfortunately. Um, where this update mode would make sense is you can, again, use a dictionary. So you would do an update mode step and mode Python, create a dictionary on uh, with your jupe step name um, as the selector value. And then uh, in each step, and that's when the step name changes, it's going to reevaluate um this uh this um, environment script and it might then for example uh be called build environment sh or run environment sh and so on so you can have some dynamic uh, naming here as well so um and because this potentially is dynamic um i i want to have that uh, in a parameter so i can abstract that in all my other um uh, parts of the configuration don't have any um, hard-coded names in them. So and then I basically source the environment uh, script, which is located in my environment home, and we'll um, get to that later on how, um, uh, how that is uh, determined, but only if environment home is actually defined, otherwise just do a module load, yeah? And uh, then I said, I want to record all the components that are part of um, my uh, my environment, yeah, that I use for uh, for the measurement, and uh, uh, so I define an environment co components list, um, and because I use the comma here, um, which makes it easier to um, actually use it as a list directly, um, then uh, um, uh, I have to specify a separate separator here. And then what I can use, again, use some Python magic later on. So what this mode Python expression does, it takes my, my components list, splits it at the comma, 
And uh, basically, that creates uh, a list itself. And for each element x in this uh, in this list, which is not empty, it joins joins it again um, with uh, uh, with a comma. So what it does is. If I don't have CUDA defined, then CUDA module will be empty. And then I have comma, comma in this list. So basically, this gets rid of all the, uh, the empty components, the components that are not part of my definition. And then the next one here actually uses, um, creates the suffix for my directory name. And there I, I take the cleanup list, I replace, um, uh, uh, I, I replace the slash and the module uh, name because each of these modules here is module name slash version. So I replace those with a dash. So in my name, I have module name dash version. And I, um, I join those with, uh, uh, with an underscore. So my name would be underscore um, GCC dash 11.2 underscore CUDA dash uh, 10.1 and so on. Yeah. So that and and that again, I only do if uh, I do have environment components um, uh, available here. All right. And then uh, I, I basically have this component suffix strings and um, I place my tool chain in there. But as I said, you can also have this whole environment uh, defined by one uh, uh, by one string. And I have the environment prefix, and looking into the uh, the uh, prefix and the home, um, the the home contains the full install path, the fully qualified install path at the very end, and the prefix controls where to install this. And this is basically your jailbreak, where you can say, well, I want to have this not relative to my benchmark, but I want to have it as part of uh, my home directory. Yeah, here this would be uh, relative to my benchmark, and uh, but you can also define your prefix in uh, whatever uh, dynamic way you deem uh, interesting. Yeah, and the name string itself here that is um, uh, just contains the fully quali qualified description of your environment. Okay, so let's get to the last lesson. Sorry for uh, uh, taking um, a little longer than expected on this. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the problem here is that um, uh, you um, uh, want, want to reduce the configuration duplication because there are different tasks that appear over and over again across the different benchmarks, which, for example, is build the software or create um, a, a job script and submit the job script and so on. Yeah, so and that is that is redundant code and um, uh, you usually want to have if you have some form of optimization you want it to be ready readily available to all of your uh, your benchmarks in your suite so um, we want to have something to reduce the code copy here and uh, to look at that basically how this could look in uh, when it's basically done when it's finished I could have uh, so so this is basically directly taken um, from uh, a benchmark that I um, uh, have in the suite, and the only thing that I raised was some um, uh, benchmark specific cleanup here at the end. But this is boilerplate. This I can do copy paste, and um, that is the only part of copy paste that I need to do. And we'll see how much this uh, actually. Um, reduces uh, in in, uh, in a number of lines and also in functionality. So, and um, as I said, most of this comes from the default XML and uh, we have, we use the include um, feature of Jupe here and we're, where we basically uh, follow a certain XML path and grab everything that's below a certain path. So let's look at the default XML. We have a path environment generate script, and it would grab everything uh, um, underneath the, the, the asterisk there. And it will automatically do the use environment piece set. It would use the um, 
uh, the substitute set for the environment files, it would um, use the uh, environment files. I don't have to explicitly write any of this anymore. All of this comes down to a single line in line three here. So, and if we move on to the execution part, uh, there the, we have a preparation part for my, my run step where I have to use um, the job submission parameter set, CPU, uh, CPU binding piece set. Uh, I want to have some additional sanity checks and that's an interesting feature here. You can have recursive includes. So you can include something that includes something else. That's also, that's, um, you need the newest version of Juke because that was a feature request that I had. Um, so, uh, and then you would uh, use some, some more in there. And all of this again is boiled down to a single line in your benchmark um, configuration. And then again, the submission where I come to optimization, uh, you want to have readily available. What you, what you find here is basically that um, uh, a definition of how to either create a job script and submit the job script to a batch system if the system has a batch system and you want to use it, or use MPI exec uh, and host lists uh, directly if you want to um, start your job manually. Because sometimes you want to uh, run this, uh, this code on, uh, on uh, uh, platforms that are not yet in the batch system. Yeah. Um, so, and all of this, I um, won't go into uh, detail maybe in the Q&A later, but uh, all of this basically um, is readily available to any benchmark uh, that I've written. So I don't need to, to reinvent the wheel on this. This was basically a, uh, a single point of implementation. So then the, the system piece set just has a definition of, and this is again in the default. So it's all benchmarks, all, uh, all systems. I usually think a system has a batch system and um, I, uh, I usually want to submit to batch uh, if I uh, if has a batch system is true. If has a batch system is false, I don't want to submit to, to a batch. Or if I explicitly know uh, it has a batch system, but I don't want to submit at this stage, um, I can provide the tag no submit. And that uh, functionality again is available to uh, everything. Uh, or like to uh, uh, all the benchmarks. And then for the specific system itself, I only have to define this one does not have a ben uh, um, uh, does not have a batch system. And then it'll automatically revert to the host uh, host list uh, generation. Okay, so then let's get to the to the summary. Um, uh, I think the the most important uh, takeaways of this. Uh, uh, this webinar would be that large parts of configurations are similar for multiple benchmarks. So you want to increase reuse as much as possible. Yeah, um, prefer dynamic parameter value generation over tagging static, static values. Um, use tags for the very high level decisions like selecting a certain tool chain um, or the submission style like no submit would say, well, this run does not submit the, um, uh, uh, the batch script and so on, uh, and use Python expressions to generate values judiciously during the configuration. And finally, initialize parameters with empty strings, um, because otherwise you might have some weird uh, Python artifacts where you have a lookup and it might be none because there's no object behind what you were uh, looking at. Okay, so you find some further information on the Jupe homepage and the Jupe documentation, which is actually quite nice. And uh, with that, I want to thank you for um, your attention. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mark andre for this uh, very detailed talk. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry for, for going. Yeah, no, um, that, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, uh, lots of, uh, I think, useful information in there. Um, I don't see any questions so far. 
Um, this might be coming from uh, the issue that I guess uh, many people didn't expect that they were supposed to know uh, some basic tube stuff uh, before and um, um, you should yeah, have, but, yeah. Yeah, but feel free, like to, to the audience, feel free to ask any tube question, uh, even if it's not related to, to what I presented today, if uh, that was yeah. uh, too much so, detail. Uh, yeah, like, like uh, Mark Andre showed in the very beginning, there is already very existing uh, material, uh, video material on, on introductions. And um, so um, if you, you haven't been a user already, uh, please just go, go back, uh, look at these, uh, like the introduction by Stefan Lures or the longer one uh, by Mark Andre. Uh, use it, play around with it. And if you run into issues, then, <laughs> Re review this uh, presentation here. But uh, we have one a question from uh, Simon. Uh, do you have experience combining con containerization, like for example, singularity and tube? Or do you see use cases here? Um, uh, it would be interesting to see whether you want to parameterize, parameterize the image generation with PSETs, whether that makes sense at all. I think there's yeah, so, two questions. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, the answer to the first or the first half uh, would is quite short. I don't have uh, personally have experience with um, uh, using Jupe with containers. Uh, here in Aachen, we have containers basically um, available in um, uh, as modules. So. Um, my initial take on using containers as part of my software environment, I would um, add uh, the, the container modules as one of my, my components of my environment. Um, so if the container is already there, of course, you can also use Jupe to generate a container, um, like creating um, uh, um, uh, uh, all the the, the, basically the the manifest and and all of that for for the container definition, build the software, and yeah, you you you, Jupe is a workflow system, workflow management system. So you don't have to um, submit a batch job with every workflow that you have. So you can also have Jupe configuration that just builds lots of containers in different configurations for you. So that is also something that I could. Um, see Jupe uh, uh, be useful in working with con uh, containers. And I think I uh, forgot what the last question was. Yeah, basically, would uh, it be uh, interesting to you, yeah, like to use the P sets to parameterize the building of the images for yes, the containers? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, could, I could definitely see that. OK. Do we have another question coming? Yeah, so I guess, as I said, uh, uh, we have a little issue that like, not everyone kind of has already some basic uh, experience here. Um, given the uh, kind of like the late time already, I I but would stop the seminar here. So thank you very much, Mark Andre, for taking your time, and and I hope Thanks, at man. least like it was not useful to you now. It would be uh, useful in the in the future for you uh, when you re-listen uh, this webinar. And this basically brings me to the point where um, uh, basically I want to basically invite you uh, to our next webinar. Uh, there's another one uh, lined up. Um, we will not have any uh, a webinar in November because I said it's two billion the end of a month, but end of a month is supercomputing and many people are either busy preparing for supercomputing or are at supercomputing. So we decided that the next webinar will be um, uh, early December and it will be about uh, uh, HPC system and job monitoring uh, and uh, by using a system called LLVU. And so that would be the next uh, seminar. And then we are in the process of um, basically lining up new speakers uh, uh, for additional webinars next year. Um, if you have specific interest or something uh, like, oh, I always wanted to hear something about this one or about this and this topic, uh, 
please let us know. Like either send it by risk or um, send it to me, Burn More. Like Burn More at ULIC, you, you easily find my, my homepage and, and, and how to contact me. Um, so thanks everyone for listening in and um, thanks for taking the time to stay with us and um, yeah, talk to and see you again uh, on, on the 7th of uh, December. Thank you.